Hello, and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast, and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. This week we're getting into part two with Terry Kuchaluchis. We go a little bit deeper into his background and then we start to have a conversation around the dynamic between buyers and sellers. Uh, There's been a shift between how service providers and manufacturers need to approach their customers. It's happened in every field, in every industry, but it's, it's really pronounced in the healthcare sales space and especially in the medical device sales space. And the pandemic has just served as a catalyst to exactly where things are headed. And this is what Terry gets into today. So it's going to be a nice interview. You're going to enjoy listening to it. But I'm not going to give anything away. So as always, thank you for listening to the Medical Sales Podcast. And I really do hope you enjoy this interview. What inspired the move from Guy? Um, so it was funny. When, when Boston Scientific bought Guy, then, um, they had to sell the stent division to Abbott for antitrust purposes. So I was working in the pacemaker division at that point in time. But, so I was a part of Boston Scientific on the pacemaker side. And all my colleagues that I'd grown up with for the previous probably seven or eight years were with the stent division with Abbott. And so I spent about five or six years, you know, with Boston Scientific and, you know, I just had a yearning to do a little bit more. And, you know, so, you know, one day one of my buddies from Abbott called and said, Hey, you know, I'd like to have you take a look at coming back over here. And we don't really have a role for you yet, but, you know, we think we've got a leadership role for you. Why don't you come over and, you know, see what happens. And I, and I did. So I went over to Abbott. Wow. Yeah, it's, you know, you, you kind of have this theme in your career that people just saw your value in every position and you, you created an opportunity where you can take a role. I mean, no matter what, no matter what company you went to, that's what it sounds like. And that's great. So during this time, where was your family life? I mean, oh, you're, 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 you're a leader. You're very busy. You're, you're literally making moves from company to company. Decision makers are seeing your value. They're bringing you into roles. What's going on at home? So, you know... I was single, you know, for the early part of single in Chicago. Um, I got married when we were in New York and I was working for, you know, um, the first Boston Scientific Acquisition Company with Pfizer. And then, um, you know, I will tell you that I lived in Florida and, you know, got married, you know, had a child. And I can tell you that, you know, being a sales professional, being dedicated to your work and being dedicated to your family is a really challenging thing. Right. Um, And so like my, you know, it was a lot easier when you're local, like when you're, when you're carrying a bag in your home every night, it's a lot easier. Right. And then you become, you know, a sales leader, you know, and I actually moved my entire family, like my one-year-old son and my wife, we moved to California to do that marketing role. And it was, right after 111. So we're, I don't know, if, you know, just or after 911. So the world was kind of crazy then too. Um, but you know, my family has grown up with me in the medical device space and they've been really patient and understanding. Um, you know, as I was a regional sales leader, I was home a lot more, but then as you start growing in your scope of responsibilities, right. And this is probably if there's you know, any regret or things that I could do differently or change about my current role today versus where it was before is that, you know, when you're a national sales leader and I've been a national sales leader multiple times, um, you know, you're on the road close to 200 days a year. Wow. Like, yeah. You literally, you wake up Monday and you come home Thursday or Friday, or you, Wait, you know, you're leaving Tuesday and coming home Friday. And then you're also away on weekends for conferences right. or national sales meetings. And, um, 
you know, you've really got to kind of get your family ready for something like that. Um, the one thing that I always try to do was that when I was home, I was home. Right. Okay. And so when I, when I always walked in the door, I always did my best that I was done. Right. And I think that's kind of what, what's been hard for people with the pandemic is like, they don't have that separation of work and home anymore. Like it kind of just all starts feeling fuzzy, right. Where it's all together. And, um, you know, I used to love the fact, I mean, I can remember <laughs> plenty of times when I would be sitting in my driveway, still having conference calls. Like I'd be on the road having calls and I wouldn't, I wouldn't come in the house having calls because like when I walk in the door and you have two little kids and you know, my kids are grown now, like my son's getting ready to be a, a senior in college. My wife, my, my daughter just graduated from high school. She's getting ready. So they're, but when they're, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you got, all they do is they want you and you walk in the door and you got to be ready for that. And so I would just say that, you know, Pick your time wisely. Um, you know, like I work out way early in the morning. Like when I work out, it's like 4 35 o'clock in the morning. It's not invading anybody's space. Right. Like when I get home and my family's here, I like to make sure that I can give my family the 150% effort that I give my customers and my company from eight to five or eight to six or whenever it is. But, you know, Try to do your best that when you're at home and you're not doing work, put your phone away, right? And 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 focus on your family the way you focus on your job. And bring that balance into it. Because you know, I've I've certainly have made a lot of mistakes and you know, traveling and not, you know, spending as much time as I wished I could have. And, you know, but I did. I spent a lot of time with my my kids and my son, especially with golf and junior golfer. We, did a lot of tournament travel and all that kind of stuff. But I would just say, turn it off when you're at home, right? And and give your family the same effort you give your customers and your company during the day. All right. So then after Abbott Vascular, you know, you, you, you completed Abbott Vascular, you were divisional vice president on national strategic account sales, and then you went into Siemens. Yeah. So, so what... Until, again, what inspired that last move? Yeah, and, it's and really all. interesting. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good question. So, because it's such a different role too. If you look at like my career, it's pretty much all sales, other than that two-year. You know, you're going to go be in marketing for a couple of years, right, and right. Do that rotational role. Um, you know, I carried a bag for ten years, and I, I, I will tell you that I am that I am that that salesperson every day of my life. Mm -hmm. Like even when I was a sales leader, regional leader, area leader, national leader, strategic and corporate accounts, you know, I'm still the salesperson so carrying the bag every day. And that's where my mindset is. Um, and so I had an opportunity to come to Siemens Health and Ears and, you know, my current boss here, you know, I work with at Abbott and um, they had a unique opportunity to do something really transformational here. Um, my role didn't exist before I got here. So the head of marketing, sales operations, communications for North America was a new role that they were just beginning to look at. And inside of the group that we, that I had up today, there were, there were groups and people embedded into our businesses and our sales organizations that did these things sort of, you know, off to the side supporting those groups. We brought all these folks together to create a centralized shared service organization to support the entire North American enterprise, to have consistency, to have a single view and language. We wanted to represent ourselves to our customers as one company, one enterprise, one Siemens Health and Ears versus three or four different ones. And this was a good way to start that. So, um, we came in and we brought folks together. Um, we pulled them out from their original structures. We regrouped everybody into the organizations that, you know, we did five years ago. It's iterated. You know, we're constantly evolving, by the way. The team is resilient. And, you know, as the markets change, as our organization change, as the needs increase and new demands come up, our team is constantly pivoting and doing things in a different way. But, um, you know, my current boss brought me, you know, you know, 
he had an opportunity. He said, you know, it was posted. I looked at it online. I said, hey, I'd love to come over and, and help you with your new role here. And, and, you know, he was kind enough to put me in the process. And, you know, I, find, I found a way to get the role. Excellent. Excellent. When you think about the way you've been leading uh, this entire division for the last five years, and you think about your leadership role in Abbott, those are different levels of leadership. What would you say the biggest differences are? Well, I think there's there are two different organizations, by the way, too. They're two very successful organizations, right? Um, you know, they have different, you know, foundations from a headquarter perspective. There's a different culture perspective. There's, you know, a different set of a mindset on how they view process and precision. And it's just, you know, but they're both really, really successful in their own ways, right? Um, what I would say is, is that, um, I constantly am evolving myself as a leader, right? And trying to improve, you know, each and every day and try to adapt to different situations. And so I can tell you being a leader internally is different than being a leader from a, for a sales organization's perspective, right? Totally different mindset. Like, you know, um, you know, leading people in IT and data science and, you know, people that are more techie in nature, is different than leading 150 extroverts versus maybe a bunch of introverts. So it's been, you know, interesting to see the different styles of people and, and, you know, how it's made me a better leader, a better person, a better listener, a better collaborator, um, you know, just with the structure of Siemens Health and Ears, it's a multi-matrix organization. And so there's a lot of complexity just by the way we're organized on how we have to work together and support each other, um, globally and locally from a North American perspective, all of our businesses. And it's been definitely the most rewarding, challenging opportunity I've ever taken on in my career, for sure. Okay. Exactly. All right, so let's jump to where you are today, Senior Vice President of Sales Operations. What is the biggest challenge your division is facing? Uh, get into that and what are you guys are doing around it? So I think, you know, looking at how to constantly evolve yourself as an organization. You know, I would consider Siemens Health and Ears as a, an organization that has 130 years in healthcare. Just think about that for a second. Like it's been around for 130 years, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, I don't know how many companies can say that, but I pro it's probably less than five or six on healthcare, right? It's for sure, um, there's very few. And because we're always been very successful, I think it's very challenging. I'm probably speaking for a lot of companies. When you're successful, driving change and transformation is really hard because there's no, the house isn't burning down. Like, you know, nobody's starving. Everybody's still eating, right? You know, nobody's looking at it and saying, okay, there's, there's nothing to eat in the cupboard, right? Um, and so, you know, how do you constantly keep an organization moving forward. And so what I would say the most, some of the biggest challenges I see, especially with COVID is that, um, and we've actually weathered COVID really well. I'm very impressed with our organization, the resiliency of our people. By the way, I would just say that, like, I know it's been a really challenging couple of years for a lot of different ways, but I look at it in some ways as a very, positive reflection on our people as a society is that um, it never amazes me how resilient humans are That's right good. and like I said there's a lot of people that can talk about how crappy the world has been for the past couple of years but I look back on it and I think how wonderful it is that we're at today and we couldn't have done it without each other and that we as a a species and a human and as an organization of people and a community have come together, work together, and we're coming, we're going to come on the other side of this with some acceleration. And, and I think we, there's a lot of ways we should be really proud of where we're at versus, you know, you see all the, if you read in the newspaper clippings or if you're reading the news or you're on social media, there's always a negative this or a negative that. And you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that there hasn't been hard things. And I certainly, with all the deaths that have been out there, has been awful for people. Yeah. But I also think that we as a human 
species has, we've responded and we will continue to do that. And we're, we're, and I just find our resiliency amazing. So, you know, just, just so everyone has full context, give us a little bit more about what you are. So, so the division you're in, you're expected to drive transformation and change for mm -hmm. engineers. Yep. What does that actually look like? I mean, what does it look like on a like, good day? And I guess, what does it look like on a bad day? How about that? Well, I, I don't know if I'm expected to drive change, right? I think what I'm expected to do is to help position the organization to continue to be a leader in the business, right? And whether, and depending on what time it is, like it, sometimes like, you know, you don't want change. Sometimes it's better to keep it smooth and moving, right? Right now it's changing. When you look at what, the pandemic has done to our society in terms of the virtual nature you look at. Um, and I was just thinking about this today on my run because I know I was coming on here to talk about like all these different dynamics that are creating variability in our world. Okay. And, you know, this is one thing that I also believe. I believe that change happens to you. But I think transformation is something that you do internally to adapt to change. Right. right. And so um, what I see is, is that there's a lot of variables of change. There's COVID always, it's going to change the world forever. Right. We have changing demographics. We have changing technology. Um, and those are going to put a major, major change in stress, I think, in the healthcare workplace. Right. Um, and if you're a manufacturer or vendor or a solution provider in healthcare and you're trying to promote products and get people to buy your products in healthcare, you're gonna have to figure out different ways to do it because your customers are changing, right? Right. You know, and I don't know if this falls in line with healthcare, but anywhere from 60 to 80% of a buyer's process before COVID was done without the seller. Okay. Okay. And then and that's with technology changing. And yeah, I can go back, you know, 20 some years when I was selling technology, medical technology, it was almost 80 or 90% was done with the seller and the buyer together. Right. 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 You know, I used to sell a device and all I had to do was get a doctor to say yes. Okay. And I go into the OR, we put some stuff in and then I would go take my PO to purchasing and I would get paid. Right. 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 And then 20 years later, all of a sudden, you know, there's these things called integrated delivery networks. There's, you know, there's VAT committees for value assessment of technology. All of a sudden, now you had to have 10 people to agree on a, a product or a platform or now, or now a formulary. I mean, so the complexity of the buying cycles changed, right? And then there's the internet of things and there's social media and there's virtual and there's all this different stuff. There's consultants, right? Right. And so now the buyer's journey, right, is done without the seller 60 to 80% of the time. So that's one part of the problem, okay? Then COVID hits, right? Now it's like 80% is done without the seller. And now it's done without the seller live. That's another thing, right? So there's two dynamic things happening in the marketplace. And then there's, you know, there's data with the fact that you know, and I'll go back to the, the generational demographics, right? Yeah. That also has a 70% of the workforce will be millennial in five years. Okay. That means 70% of the buying force is going to be millennial in five years. And millennials buy differently the way, the, the way I buy. Tell us right? a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about how millennials do it compared to well, like generation. I'm not a millennial, so I can't speak to it, but I can tell you what the research says. Okay, okay, okay sure. As a disclaimer, but yes, go ahead. So I don't want to offend anybody because I am not a millennial and I can't, I'm not, you know, but I can tell you what, you know, Gartner, Forrester, Bain & Company, Accenture, um, and a lot of very, you know, smart, intelligent organizations are telling me, right? Sure. Okay. Is that, um, you know, millennials want to buy on their own terms, right? They want to do their own research. Um, they do want to engage a seller, but they want to engage a seller when it comes time to um, ask questions. They want an authentic seller. They want somebody that can be a consultant. They don't really want a sales like a seller. Sure. They just want somebody who's going to help 
them on their buying journey. They want somebody that's gonna create a good buying experience, right? They want somebody that's gonna be informational when they need it. Sure. Um, but they also, when they're not with the seller, right? And I mean the human seller, they also want to be on the internet. They, they, they need information the way they want it. If they can't find it on their phone, by the way, I think we're all in trouble. Like if you're depending on the internet, if it's not on the phone, a millennial is not going to engage it. I'm sorry. Okay. It's just not going to happen. 54% of millennials. Okay. And this is a business to business perspective. This is not business to consume. It's not B2C. This is not buying a pair of tennis shoes data. Okay. This is business to business. On Average, 43% of all sellers today or all buyers do not want a seller at all. They want zero seller involvement. 43%. 43%. Okay. This is from Gartner. Okay. So I'm not making this stuff up. Yeah. The one that was kind of surprising me, 20% of all Gen Xers don't want a seller involved at all. Yeah. Okay. 54% of millennials do not want a seller. 54% of millennials do not want a seller. And when they do want a seller, they want a seller there to just ask questions, okay? And there's other things too, like um, they will ask friends and family what they think. Brand is important to them. Price is not that as, as important as other things. That's the brand. Yeah. as the brand, right? They want it They want it easy. And if you think about like, you think about where the world's going, like, and if you can buy, literally buy a couch on Wayfair in three minutes, okay? Right. Right? Yeah. The B to C model is setting such a high bar for B to C that people are, you cannot create a frustration on the B2B that they don't have on B2C. You've got to be B2C capable in a B2B environment or you won't win down the road. I mean, yeah. that's just my, that's Terry's personal opinion, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because seriously, like I can, I can't, you know, I set up, you know, rotation to buy dog food every month, right? I don't even have to buy it anymore. It's just auto, right? right? I'm on subscription. Right. Um, you want to go outfit a living room. You can take a picture of the living room. Okay. You can put some colors in and you can hit a button and boom and Wayfair will tell you, here's what, here's what we suggest. Right. And it'll put it in your cart for you and right. you can hit a button and buy it. I mean, you can actually like furnish the whole thing decoratively right. in 10 minutes. Right. Right. Hey, what used to take like four or five weeks to do, and you can narrow it down to a 10 minute exercise. Okay. Right. If you want it that simple. Right. Um, and I believe in, in the B2B environment, those same standards are going to exist. If you can't operate that way, and it's going to be a big challenge because B2B products and solutions, we all know that are typically, it's more complicated than buying a blender or a pair of tennis shoes or a pair of shorts. Right. I mean, think about it. You can go to a company like Stitch, right? They will send you an outfit, like with shoes and a belt and the whole thing. You just hit a button, you know, so, and you're styling, and you're styling so like this, that. So then, okay. So it sounds like you're saying for the future of B two B is uh, a business needs to already a, a know what the customized solutions might be, and have some type of platform that allows the customer to run through that without the interaction of a sales rep. When traditionally the sales rep would walk them through whatever the customized solution should be. Yeah, and I would say yes, but I, I, I wanna say and, okay? okay. Yes, please, preach on that. So definitely yes, but in healthcare, I don't know how can the solutions are, right? So there's variability, like in, there's human variability and healthcare is not the same there's not, you know, a pair of tennis shoes don't work. Or if you don't like the red tie from Stitch, nobody's going to die. Right. Nobody's going to lose right. an eye, right? Right. I mean, right? So the consequences aren't the same. Sure. Um, so you have to have, and I, and I do think the buyer understands that too. Like, I think they understand there's a, 
there's a difference in consequence. But my point is psychologically, what I'm trying to say is, is that the buyer's mindset is built upon simplicity and ease of use and great experience, right? And so whatever we're doing on the healthcare side needs to keep in mind that that experience and that ease of use is really important. For example, buying a car, you can go and configure your car. You can pick your color, you can pick your leather, you can pick your engine, you can pick two wheel, all wheel, front wheel. You can pick, you know, matte, glossy, you know, right. Right. And without. nav, without nav, you know, cloth, leather, super leather, whatever, right? I mean, you can go in and do all that. And I think our customers want that same type of interaction, you know, with our stuff. Like I, I know we're moving towards a direction where you can, you know, put, take a picture and put your room in together and go build an MRI in your room and pick all the, the bells and whistles that you want on it. And, you know, creating those experiences and what types of procedures. And, you know, we're doing, you know, digital twins of hospitals. Like, so here's your existing workflow for a certain patient pathway, right? And then on the other side, you can say, what if, and you kind of go, let's build a different workflow. Let's build a, build a different pathway. And you can actually create an artificial experience that allows you to experiment with workflow and patient care and all those things that allow the buyer to kind of, you know, modify and sort of self-solution along the way. So it's just, you know, we're getting smarter and, you know, the data's out there, how we use the data, how we're using machine learning and artificial intelligence to help us. I think we're, you know, we're infinitesimally the way there. We're just on the, you know, at least in healthcare, I think we're just at the very tip of the iceberg and with more time, more experience, more technology, um, you know, 5G coming, you know, I think things will, the capability will continue to expand. It's really exciting. But I think it's all about that experience, but you need that variability too. I don't think it's going to be, you know, door one, two or three, and that's it. Right. I think that well, healthcare well, is a little different. Well, that's the thing, right? Because you would think that because of that variability, you'd still need the sales rep in light of millennials wanting yeah, to not have it. You still need that sales rep because of that variability and the fact that you're right. Lives are on the line. And, and this is what we're talking about in healthcare. Totally agree. And I, but I think the roles in healthcare are going to change. You're always going to need, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you're going to have, you know, sales robots or, you know, that's not going to happen. I really believe in the human. I, I truly, truly do. But I do think that how sales and marketing in healthcare, their roles are going to change and become a lot more congruent. It used to be like, here's a the marketing vertical and here's the sales vertical, right? And then you try to get them to work together. And I actually think that, you know, marketing's taking on a bigger role because as as buyers are spending less time with sellers, where are they they're spending time on the internet, right? And they're yep, spending they time, time with them, whoever the marketing is creating. And that's, and that's right. where marketing is, right? Yeah. So, and then I, I do think in healthcare, um, I think things are going to change there too from like, you know, in the tech space, like software companies have done a phenomenal job of using um, what I call a, a sales development or a business development role. And I've really got a great appreciation in working with some of our, our tech partners that they have this role is they, they engage you from a marketing perspective online or social channels, right? Here's our solution. And then when you say, hey, I'm interested and I clicked into it and I've done some reading and I've downloaded a white paper, then they have somebody who's behind the scenes kind of nurturing me either with continued digital engagement, or maybe somebody picking up a phone and say, hey, I've seen you, you've read two or three of our papers. What do you think? Right. right? So they, they have this business development or the sales development role that's nurturing that demand generation and then getting it ready to hand over to an account executive to actually become that more live engaged, you know, um, solution consultant, right? Because, and again, if you really want to look at what millennials are looking for, they want, they want somebody who's going to help them actually buy something that they need, right? And so I, I do think that's all sort of evolving. And that's where I'm kind of looking at in the next five years, where do we as medical technology and device manufacturers and solution providers, how do we create a 
a valuable buying experience, right? And we haven't even talked about, we we're just talking about the, the seller buying experience. You and I haven't even gotten into the ownership experience yet, right? Because there's a buy and then right. there's an own piece, right? Right. right? And and the other side of this thing too, as I told you, as sellers are spending less time or buyers are spending less time with sellers, guess what's also increasing? Buyer's regret has gone up 2X. So, you know. Like catch 22. That's why the owner's experience, they need to do some attention. Yeah, so that's why I think we need to think about like that ownership, that customer experience piece, which tech has really spent a lot of investment on. When you look at, they actually have customer experience teams. And again, I just think things are evolving and, you know, millennials are all about ex experience. And that was Terry Kuchaluchas. Millennials are all about experience. Now I'm a millennial. I'm on I'm on the the higher end, <laughs> closer to the Gen Xer of a millennial, but I'm a millennial nonetheless. And you know I would have to agree that it is about the experience. Um, and, and I don't think it's. I do believe that everyone is is leaning towards that, right? Yes, the millennials drove it, and and Terry goes deep into that. But it's something that we all want to experience. We all want an amazing experience. We don't want to feel like we're being sold to. We want the right questions answered. We want our immediate needs addressed. And we want to feel like whatever we're about to get into or purchase or invest in is a true solution to what's going on with us. So this was, this was excellent. Now, this is not the end of it. Yes, there is a part three. That is the last segment with Terry Kuchaluchis. And we're going to dive even a bit deeper into the data and all the insights that Terry has around this entire dynamic. So make sure you tune in next week to get that. And if you're someone out that's looking for a solution, you're thinking about this industry, you're wanting to be a part of it, you want to get involved in the medical device sales world or the pharmaceutical sales world or any healthcare sales related role. You want to be a part of that and you're trying to get in. You've been maybe you've been spending time online, submitting to every place you can find, or maybe you've been trying to, you know, going to interview after interview and not really getting the traction or not even getting into the second or third round then you need to have a discussion with us because we actually do have solutions, vetted solutions that are working for people. You can find us at EvolveYourSuccess.com and just select Attain a Medical Sales Role or you can find me on LinkedIn under Samuel Dayinka. Send a connection request or reach out to us and one, me or, or a client specialist will get in contact with you and we'll have a discussion about where you are and how we can help. And if you're in the sales role and you're looking for a way to improve your performance, Maybe you're looking for a new way to access customers. Maybe you're looking for a new way to manage your territory. Maybe it's a career move that you're trying to make and things just have not been syncing up the way you need them to. Then again, reach out to us. Go to Evolve a Success. Select Improve Sales Performance and get in contact with us. Someone will reach out to you. One of our client specialists will have a discussion and we'll help you get to where you want to go. As always, you know we do what we can to bring you guests great, amazing guests doing fantastic things out there in the world with great insights into how the industry works, what they experience, what their roles are, and where they're taking things. So thank you for listening and make sure you tune in next week for another episode of the Medical Sales Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.